Welcome alumni and friends. Happy reunions to those of you who are here celebrating. Uh, thank you for joining our program, What is Love? I'm Joe Suprana. I'm the Director of Academic Engagement with Lifelong Learning in Alumni Engagement and Development. And this session of the Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute is part of our theme, Big Questions, which is inspired by the Purpose Project with the Keenan Institute for Ethics. So to get us started, I am pleased to introduce my colleague and our moderator for today's session, Katherine Joe. She's the Director of Program Development and Design at the Purpose Project at the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Welcome to the Forever Learning Institute, Katherine. Thank you, Joe. Glad to be here. So today's session reflects some of the big questions we tackle in the Keenan Institute's Purpose Project. Uh, the Keenan Institute for Ethics is a home for faculty, students, and staff dedicated to understanding the moral challenges of our time. And the Purpose Project at Duke, uh, it's funded by the Duke Endowment, and it is an interdisciplinary and multi-school project that aims to make questions of meaning, purpose, and character integral features of the Duke experience. So in today's session, you'll hear uh, more about one very important aspect of these questions. And I am joined on stage by uh, my colleagues and our speakers for today, directly to my left. We have Mark Anthony Neal, James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of African and African-American Studies. To his left, Omid Safi, a triple Duke alum and Professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. And to his left, Vanessa Woods, uh, a research scientist in evolutionary anthropology. And I don't remember the name of your friend. Oler. This is Oler. Oler. He will also be presenting today. Yes. Uh, we welcome all of our speakers and uh, to get us started, we'll have Omid speaking to give us your thoughts on what is love. Well, hello, friends, and uh, welcome back to what I hope is and has felt like your home. If you are of a certain generation, we won't say which generation, and you see a title called What is Love, I fully expect you in your head to be running, baby, don't hurt me, because <laughs> uh, and, and if that works for you, that works, and if not, then, you know turn to the person next to you and ask them. Um, so I get to teach a seminar at Duke that the students call the love course. Um, it's flattering to be referred to that way. And here's what we start out with on the first day of class is if you pay attention to a lot of the movies, a lot of the songs out there, love, seems to be ubiquitous. It's the subject, or at least the background, of a lot of the material in our pop culture. But the way that we talk about love, um, here's your second reference to pop culture, it's a little bit like we're talking about the Matrix movie, where you're looking for the one. This person has all the signs of being the one. Is he or she the one? I don't know. They could be, they act like the one, they move like the one, they talk like the one, but are they really the one? And if you think about how, when we talk about love, most of the time in our popular culture, the focus is on a romantic, physical, and if you can get it, and it's the holy month of Ramadan, so it's halal and kosher, sexual kind of a love. If you can get it and it's reciprocal and it's mutual, muzzle tough. <laughs> Congratulations. And at the same time, we got 8 billion people and a lot of non-humans, a lot of sentient beings on the planet. And if the model of love that we have is one that is so restricted so that it's focused on one person as the ideal embodiment of the one, true love. In my highly trained triple Duke PhD, also got married at Duke, also has had children born at Duke. I'm running out of Duke affiliations. They better bury me somewhere because that's about the only thing left. In my highly trained Duke education, that's what we call a dumbass model of love. <laughs> Because what we're left with is 
8 billion people. And unless your partner is a heck of a lot more open-minded than mine, one person and one person only can fulfill that role of being the one. In, in my tradition, in the Islamic tradition, we move in the other direction. If you can get the romantic, the physical, the sexual, and it is good and it's reciprocal, wonderful. But can we think about love as being expansive? Can we think about love as the love of the self, the love of parents, the love of children, the love of a neighbor, the one that we're struggling with right now, the love of a stranger, the love of human beings halfway around the world to whom you are absolutely not related racially, religiously, linguistically in any way, uh, the love of a puppy, the love of a cat, the love of trees, of rain, of sunshine, of air, of the soil. So in this love course, sometimes students expect to come in and read a lot of love poetry, and we do, and we do. But we also want to talk about what if love is actually a shorthand for God, for being, for creation, for existence, and the dominant metaphor that we get in our tradition is that love is nothing other than the outpouring of the divine into this realm. It is love that brings you here. It is love that sustains you here. And if you can just for a minute or two, get over your own damn self. Your mama lied. You're not that special. Or at least no more special than every other breathing soul on this planet, if you can get over yourself and merge into that cosmic current of love, it will carry you back home to your divine origin. So got a few little pictures here to show you. Let's see if this thing works. Hey, it does work. What do you know? So this is a tradition in Islam, which has included uh, illuminated sages. In another tradition, you might call them saintly beings beings, but these are mostly ordinary everyday folk, right? There's no official church or mosque hierarchy that needs to recognize them. And the most important female Muslim mystic that we have who speaks about love is this woman named Rabia, who famously ran through the middle of the street like a mad woman with a lit torch in one hand and a bucket of water or a vase in the other hand. And people are like, what are you doing, Rabia? And her answer was, I'm going to find heaven and hell. And with this torch, I'm going to burn down heaven. And with this bucket of water, I'm going to quench the fires of hell so that people have no reason left to worship God other than God, right? So that the path of love, it's not even about being saved or getting to heaven. It's about this love affair with God and through God. Well, we got lots of wonderful stories and a lot of what I get to do in my life is to go through medieval texts and translate some of these things. So we're told that one day she's walking past the door of a church, mosque, temple. It's not clear in the passage. And there's a preacher sitting on there, and he's essentially paraphrasing the line that a lot of you have heard from the Gospels, um, just like now. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask, and it shall be granted to you. And um, she just pokes her head in, and she says, what'd you say? And the preacher, the male preacher in his official robe and the funny hat, is quite annoyed that this woman has interrupted his majestic sermon. And so he says, woman, I said, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And she says, my friend, 
from where I am, the door has never been closed. This is also a cumulative tradition, a one in which people, teachers, poets, singers, musicians keep taking what has come down to them and they try to honor it by doing it one better. Tradition is not just perfectly preserving it like it's a museum item. It's a living tradition. So the great Rumi, whom you might have heard of as the most famous mystic poet of Islam, at one point he says, my friend, you have spent your whole life knocking and knocking and knocking at God's door. Friend, you're knocking from the inside. You're already within God, but you're already inside of the divine presence. So uh, this is the image that I chose to put on the cover of this book of mine, Radical Love, which um, is a meditation on this love tradition. Almost all the famous poets and mystics of our tradition come from this particular path. And imagine my extraordinary delight when I started studying other traditions. And I found out that sometimes verbatim, the teachings look quite similar, right? The higher up the mountain you go, the grander your vista. Um, almost verbatim, one of my mentors in the civil rights tradition, the Black-led freedom movement, um, I also get to teach the Martin Luther King course at Duke, which is a great thing about being here. Uh, the late Uncle Vincent, Vincent Harding, he used to always say that, you know, when love comes into public, we call it justice. And then when it goes inward, we call it tenderness. So this love tradition has a lot to say about how we treat those who are vulnerable. That's justice. But it's not just about being hard. You also have to learn to be tender. That balance of being fierce against injustice and tender to those around you is one of the hallmarks of this tradition. And in this image that is up on the screen, uh, you have two sages from this tradition who come up with one bold idea. We're going to write you a book of love on one condition that you never again ask us to bifurcate things into the love of God and the love of humanity. You cannot claim to love God if you don't show care for trees and for animals and for humans. So I'll wrap up by telling you a couple of the stories from this book. Uh, we're told that there's a famous um, pair of brothers. The story is a thousand years old. And the first brother is called the praying brother because he did nothing but pray morning, noon, and night. And his brother, he did his prayers, but he also took care of their mama. They had an elderly mom and he spent his whole time being, mama, can I get you a glass of water? Mama, can I walk you to the bathroom? Until the praying brother has a vision of God in which God tells him, congratulations, for the sake of your brother, I've decided to admit both of you to paradise. And he says, oh my God, I've been waiting for this my whole life. But uh, Lord, clearly you're mistaken because I think what you mean to say, oh God, is that for my sake, you are forgiven both of us. And God goes, um, no, I'm pretty clear on which one of you I'm speaking to. You know, I'm God. Um, and he says, you see, all those prayers that you did for me, I have no need of. But your mama needs you. And that mic drop line is the end of the story. That if you want to get to God, if you want to be on the path of love, you got to start looking around and ask the question, who needs you? Whom can you love? Whom can you 
serve. In the last 30 seconds I've got, <laughs> I'm going to show you one last image. I went to California, to the holiest place in California I know, Muir Woods. Two to 300 tall redwood trees, 1,000, 2,000 years old. It's a temple. It turns out that their roots, or what in the South we call roots, are six to eight feet deep. That's it. 300 feet high, six feet deep. How can they survive all the earthquake, all the storms? They have figured out the thing that we're still working on figuring out. They tie their roots together. Their roots are entangled. And when one of them starts to lean over and fall, the other ones catch it. Don't you dare fall. And if you fall, we all fall with you. That's what love and community looks like, to be a series of entangled, intertwined trees. And that's why these trees are also our teachers. Uh, thank you for coming back home. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are going to move into the Q&A portion of the program. Now, I do have some questions of my own, um, but I actually, you know, there's actually not a lot of time for questions. You know, overall, I think that there's probably a lot that could be asked. So I thought I would just maybe ask the audience if anybody is sort of rearing to kick us off with questions. So I just happened to be reading about um, Aristotle and duality. And um, sorry, I'm still emotional for me talking about the dogs. Um, um, I, I was reading um, an opinion that Aristotle's dual thinking has had um, long lasting and deep effects in separating people and separating people from other life. You talked about other sentient beings, you talked about intergenerational love, you talked about interspecies love. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, any opinions you have on those effects and how we're living with them right now. Thank you for that um, you know, wonderful, beautiful um, question. As, as you heard in terms of friends, that allow us to feel connected, connected across generations, across species. And um, the great Rumi has a wonderful short line that there are worse ways of spending a whole life than just meditating on this and living into this. And he says, that is the bridge between you and everything. Um, and an analogy that I give you, and one reason that I think Love me some Aristotle, love me some Plato. Um, but I also think there have been certain detrimental uh, readings of them and all kinds of ways in gender norms in terms of the separation between physics and metaphysics to take basic category. Uh, there have been harmful consequences of it. And, and then we have remedies. And the remedies sometimes come to us by sitting around the seminar table. Sometimes they come to us by petting a dog. And sometimes it might come from sitting at the feet of a grandparent who is rambling stories we think we've already heard, but they have an alchemical effect on us somehow. Um, and the way that I oftentimes think about ways of tapping into that wisdom tradition to heal ourselves just a little bit is for reasons that we don't entirely understand. Sometimes people talk about, I feel better. I feel more whole when I go for a walk somewhere, right? So many Duke students have that experience when they go into the gardens. And then if you have a car, you go to Eno River or into the Duke Forest. And you're like, yeah, I just I feel like I breathe easier and I'm not taking those shallow breaths. I'm really breathing <laughs> the whole of me. For some other people, it might be when you're near a mountain or I'm a Florida boy amongst other things. So when you're at the beach or when you have your feet in a brook, there's something about when you're with nature 
And people sometimes talk about it as it's when you go into nature. And the truth of the matter is that you yourself are nature. And the nature in you delights in the nature out there. You feel a sense of connection. In isolation, there's misery. In relationship and union, there's joy. And one of the great challenges for us as a human species in this moment is that we've got more technologies than ever before to communicate with one another. And sometimes it feels like we have less to say to one another and less to hear, not from one another, but with one another. So, I mean, the idea of a robotic dog scares the bejesus out of me. What's wrong with like, what's wrong with love? What's wrong with like a love dog? Um, and to figure out what is the wisdom, what is the nature in us? How is it that the rivers that are flowing out there, something of them are also flowing in you? How is it that, I'll stop, but how is it that the rain that you saw coming this morning from the sky gathers as a stream, will go into the lake. A week later, you might drink it in some water, and then it is you. And without being dramatic, a few hours after that, it will no longer be you. <laughs> so something of the clouds and of the streams has flown with you, through you. Come from the soil, you go back to the soil. The rays of the sun go through plants and end up in you. You are nature. How can we live in that sense of harmony? with nature, with generations, with our fellow plant friends and animal friends, not to mention human friends. I think these are just some of the ways of relationality, living in communion with existence and being, that we've got a lot to learn more than what some of our wise ancestors might have taught us. Well, I guess just to kind of build on that idea and just you know all of you have sort of talked about different um sort of forms of love that we might or different ways that love is manifested and sort of i appreciate that expansive notion and just using even that that word um and i'm i'm wondering you know as we think about expanding our circles um in which we can express love um you know i'm, I'm particularly thinking of you know, our current moment, there's a lot of acrimony um, in our civic and public sphere. Like, do you think that there's sort of something fundamentally the same about the kind of love we might express outside of our more intimate relationships? Or is there something different about expressing love sort of to people that might be strangers to us? So I will say the polar, um, again, when he's awake, approaches everybody um, like they're a friend, as though they're a friend. And I think um, part of the joy that the undergraduates get out of the puppy kindergarten is that the, the puppies are always just in the moment and you actually can't take care of a puppy while you're looking at your phone because they will pee on your bag, they will chew on your things, they will eat something they're not supposed to. So, um, yeah, just I, I think just approaching... Uh, and I think that friendship has been shown to be a bridge across all sorts of different groups. Um, you know, in World War II, there were these two researchers that looked at who of the Germans had saved the Jews um, during the Holocaust, um, because there were a number of Germans that put themselves and their family at risk, um, put themselves and their families and, you know, all their relatives in grave danger to save someone that they didn't know, like perfect strangers. Um, and they looked at, you know, what all these people had in common. Um, and it wasn't that they were all brave or rebellious or resisted authority figures. Um, they, they, on the surface, had 
nothing in common at all. They were zookeepers and teachers and businessmen and, and all different, you know, a whole variety of people. But what they had in common was that they all loved or knew someone who loved somebody who was Jewish. So one of the school teachers, she taught, um, you know, she taught a class of Jewish girls. There was, you know, someone else whose stepmother was Jewish. So I think when you're talking about short-circuiting dehumanization um, that we are seeing now um, and beyond prejudice where, you know, just a just dislike for another group, like actual dehumanization where you no longer think of another group as human, the only way I think that's been really shown um, over and over again to short circuit that network is friendship. And, you know, and the most powerful thing is a, is a true friendship. Any questions that have come up in your minds before I? Mm -hmm. Yes. We have a question from our virtual audience. Rusty Wright asks for Dr. Safi, thanks for explaining the Islamic tradition that service trumps prayer in obtaining God's favor. In the biblical tradition, Proverbs 15, 8 says, quote, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight, end quote. And of course, Jesus affirmed the golden rule and everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets, Matthew 7, 12. So apparently the Jewish and Christian tradition emphasize both service and prayer and pleasing God. Would this be a significant difference among the three Abrahamic traditions? You know, my, my sense is that um, if you look deep enough and wide enough in any religious tradition, uh, you tend to find that there is as much internal diversity and difference of opinion amongst them as there is sometimes between different religious traditions. Um, Martin Luther King and Vincent Harding were committed Christians. The KKK considered themselves to be Christians, perverted as hope we think that they, they are, and they were. Um, so I think, you know, you, we have to remember that people from all of our traditions have been wonderful storytellers, and sometimes they tell us stories as a seed to carry with us. For many of us, religion and prayer is optional. You want to pray, pray. You don't want to pray, don't pray. If you want to fast in this month too, if you don't want to fast, don't. In the societies from which all of our traditions came from, there's a whole lot of social prestige that was attached to public performance of religious rituals. It was not a matter of personal choice. Um, so in light of that, some of these stories that seem to accent service, kindness, over and above ritual performance, they serve the purpose in that particular society. How we would tell different stories in our own age, that's kind of up to us, not just to be receivers of stories, but also new storytellers. Um, I think I'll... And with just one kind of reminder, since we have both intergenerational and the, the wisdom of interspecies love and friendship, um, I have the great joy every year of taking adults to Turkey and Morocco. That's one of the most joyful things that I do because then the whole society is our classroom. And in Turkey, we go to a certain shrine of a medieval saint who has millions of followers all over the world. And people want to know, how did this guy get to be who he became? What was the secret? Uh, and when you look into the, all the medieval stories, the secret is about a puppy, is that his intergenerational friend, his mentor, his teacher, his guide, his guru, his sheikh, he says, you have a job for seven years, and it's to go through society and find wounded dogs and to tend to them. In that medieval society, dogs were not puppies. Dogs were not cute. Dogs were not pets. Dogs were scavengers. Dogs were kind of like what you would think of as hyenas. Dogs were dangerous. They were in packs of 
wild animals. So to be told that his spiritual discipline would be to go and find wounded dogs and bandage them up and to feed them, this was also something that carried a lot of danger. And socially, people were not lining up to pet these animals. He does this for seven years. And on the seventh year, he says, I found the dog. He was badly wounded. Uh, I took the thorns out of his paws. I bandaged him up. I fed him. And he befriended me and he rolled on his back in that cute little submission pose. And as I was rubbing his belly, he started howling. And I, out of respect to our friend, I will not <laughs> do what I would do in my classes, which is like to have everyone join in in their most dogly canine howl. And as the dog is howling, he hears that as a prayer. And so he lifts up his hands and he says, Amen, 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 Amen. He says, the moment in which I said Amen to the howling of a dog, that was the moment in which I experienced myself as being one with everything. And every quality of God became revealed to me at once. And that has never left me. So this kind of intergenerational, interspecies, transformative, alchemical love teachings, sometimes it has such an impact that the people whose lives are transformed go on to transform communities for centuries. And one of the goals that we have, of course, is not just to study such people, but in some small way to become one of them. So we'll take one last question. Thank you so much. We've spent the last hour discussing love, and it's been very insightful. I appreciate that. Have any of you done any work on the evolution of love? How did love begin? There is an anthropologist who talks about um, after having looked at remains of of human civilization, um, an archaeologist, excuse me, the first proof that she has of when love began. Um, And the proof was when she found the human skeleton of an adult being with a broken leg who had continued to live. And for her, that meant that the minute that her leg was so broken that she could no longer walk, she could no longer hunt, she could no longer escape from animals, Somebody carried her. Somebody protected her. Somebody gathered food for her. And she lived. If you're sitting here, you're alive because somebody loved you. Um, About to be a grandpa about to be a Baba for the fifth time. You have to change baby's shit. <laughs> and the first like few weeks, God, cosmos, nature plays a trick on you. It doesn't stink. And I just, no one told me the first time. I was like, they're always going to put gold and it's going to be great. And then just when you get attached, it turns. It's like oh, biological chemical weapons. I'm like, yeah, we got him in my house right here. Muslim guy with biological weapons in his house. It's my daughter's poop. And it sticks to them. Like it takes like five wipes to get it off. And in that moment, you have to make a decision, right? Does love overcome poop? The students have this debate with the puppies almost every day. Almost every time. Almost every day. Right? It's real. Shit is real. <laughs> and when the baby cries, right, here's what you don't do. You don't make an Aristotelian cost and benefit analysis chart to decide if you're going to get out of bed or not. I mean, this child just ate three hours ago. How often do these things need to be fed? What about me? Who's looking out for my needs, right? 
in that moment, you leap out of bed, you go grab your child, whether it is breast or whether it's formula or whatever, and you love and you serve. That's why they are alive. That's why we're alive. Somebody loved us. I think one of the things that I love about the work that Mark does, but the work with the puppies, is that it's about making the love that is usually private and hidden, making it public. Because bombast and vitriol is right now at the center of our public discourse. How do we take love out of the shadows, out of the private spaces, and restore it to the center of the public space? All right. So I'm sure we could all keep listening to more stories, but we will have to end. Thank you so much to our speakers for their moving insights, as well as the comical and very real. Um, so thank you, everyone.